Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. A very warm welcome to all of our audience to a new segment of programming uh, that we are starting today called Quest. And we have a very special guest today with us, uh, Akanksha Damini Joshi Ji, who has kindly joined us for this uh, new segment. Basically, in this uh, Quest, this segment, we will be interviewing people from different uh, spiritual paths or practicing different kinds of meditations, uh, spiritual practices, spiritual practices, different sampradayas, different darshanas, to just uh, know about their life journey, how, and how they are trying to seek truth, how they are trying to pursue reality, and how they are trying to make sense of reality in their individual lives. So, uh, with this uh, very brief, uh, brief uh, introduction, uh, let me first uh, uh, begin with a small prayer before going further. Sada Shiva Samarambham Shankaracharya Madhyamam Asmadacharya Paryantam Vande Guru Paramparam Ishwaru Guru Ratmeti Muti Bheda Vibhagine Vyoma Vatyapta Dehaya Shri Dakshina Murte Namaha Akanksha ji, a very warm welcome to you on our show. And uh, thank you for immediately agreeing uh, for this conversation. So uh, moving, before moving further, let me just give a uh, brief introduction to Akanksha, Akanksha ji for those who do not know. Uh, she is a multiple award-winning filmmaker, writer, and a meditation facilitator. And uh, she, uh, she has uh, made documentaries on a variety of issues, social, political, ecological, cultural, and spiritual dimensions. And over two decades, uh, uh, Akanksha ji has uh, focused on natural disasters, social conflict, environmental strife, and among other things. And her recent work has been focused on the sacred traditions of India and uh, uh, very critically acclaimed uh, documentary uh, is the uh, Hindu Nectar, which focuses on different spiritual uh, practitioners and the sampradayas spread across India. So, and, and she is a meditation facilitator. She runs meditation retreats, she teaches meditation, and a more uh, by combining different traditions with performing arts and uh, so on and so forth. And we will know more about this uh, as we move further in the session. And again, a very warm welcome to you, uh, Akanksha on the behalf of Ender Advaita Academy. So my very first uh, uh, question will be, uh, how did you develop uh, your interest in Sanatana Dharma? I mean, you have a very diverse kind of background, diverse influences. So uh, how, how was your uh, first interest perhaps in Sanatana Dharma? And how has Sanatana Dharma, the Hindu religion, philosophy, spirituality, has influenced your life on a day-to-day -day basis over the last many decades? Firstly, let me begin by thanking all of you for inviting me. Uh, it's truly an honor uh, to be uh, on your platform and to be conversing with you, Nitin. Uh, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that hugely. Um, Sanatan Dharma and my um, interest in Sanatan Dharma because I have a diverse range. You know, there are two ways that I can approach this. Um, one of it is that um, Sanatan Dharma has come to many people like myself thanks to a, a tradition of the women in this country. Uh, I attribute it to my mother, to my nani, my grandmother, my dadi. Uh, all the little stories which one hears uh, as a child, all the songs that one sings as a child, the dances that you do as a child, which are taught to you by your mothers and your grandmothers, they, uh, uh, they put the seed of the dharma within you as a child. So whatever your journey be as you grow, 
And of course, journeys are meant to be challenging. Journeys are meant to take you to different spaces um, and explore different dimensions of your being. Whatever challenges come in your life, you always remember those seeds which have been planted there by the mothers in you. So I would say the, um, the interest in Sanatan Dharma is something which was imbibed in me thanks to my family. Uh, when I was conceived, I'm told by my mother that my, my Nanaji, which is my maternal grandfather, told my mother and father that you must read to the child Ramayana, Ram Charitmanas to be specific, every night. So my parents diligently would sit and read out the Ram Charitmanas to that unborn child still. So uh, I, I truly owe it to my, uh, my family, to my mothers, the, the gift of Sanatan Dharma and my interest in it. That's one way for me to uh, respond to your question. The other side of your question, which I get is that because I have had such a diverse um, set of experiences, what has been my return back to Sanatan Dharma, because many people like myself perhaps would not have the space for looking back at Dharma. They would be too busy doing what they are doing to be able to look back into the tradition, to be able to look back into what the gems, the uh, Dharmic traditions hold. Uh, to that, um, there is a very beautiful story I remember, uh, perhaps in the Vishnu Puran, in which one day uh, Lord Vishnu is lying uh, uh, on Sheshnag and uh, he says that he has to go and explore the world to Lakshmi. And Lakshmi says, fine, you go explore the world. So he calls Garuda and they go. They go across the deserts, they go across the oceans, they fly past the mountains, they go everywhere. And Vishnu is simply looking, 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 looking. And then, you know, there comes a point where uh, Lord Vishnu says that, Karura, let's go back. So they go back and Lakshmi is waiting, you know, she's smiling, her eyes are twinkling and she's waiting. And uh, Lord, so she says, what happened? Did you find what you were looking for? So he says something very beautiful. He says, sometimes to come near, you must go very far. And perhaps that is how life is, that... You know, sometimes to come back home, we need to go far away from home. We need to realize that when you go far away from home, what the gems and the, let's say the water that can quench your thirst for lifetimes upon lifetimes, that is what your home holds. So yes, my interest has also happened because of the world that we live in which takes us far away from home. And that is the beauty of the challenge, which is Sansara today. Hmm? And um, as far as your second part is concerned on how um, Hindu Dharma has influenced my life, uh, my philosophy, I think it's in everything, Nitin, honestly, because um, one essential thing that happens, which makes the Dharmic faiths very different from the Abrahamic faiths, is the fact that there is uh, what in Hindi we say, thandak. There is, huh, there are lifetimes upon lifetimes. So there is no sense of rush. Go out there, get it, because you've just got one life to live. There is no, uh, you know, it's okay. There are lifetimes upon lifetimes. It's fine. You can have a thousand year plan. You can keep on doing what you want to do. You can keep on singing. You can keep on telling your stories. And you can keep on uh, what is said in uh, the Gita, shane, shane, slowly, slowly, or what uh, Buddha says, chare veti, chare veti, keep on walking, keep on walking. So that is an essential part, a sense of relaxedness, a sense of, ah, that Sanatan Dharma gives to each one of us, I think. And of course, very deeply to uh, your sense of, uh, I would say, an ecological awareness, a 360 degree ecological awareness in your life. That is what Dharma gives you. 
uh, that's been the biggest gift in short if i can say like that yeah uh, that is a wonderful insight uh, akanksha i think uh, uh, this uh, aspect uh, that we don't uh, usually appreciate is that we are not in a rush that this is not our one life story i mean the pressure i mean of course even in our tradition it is uh, highlighted that uh, for example in adi shankaracharya's works he highlights how it is difficult to get a human life so when we get a human life we need to make best use of it but still this recognition that this is not going to this is not the first human birth we are getting or nor will it be last it takes a lot of pressure off uh, you know the, the you know the pressure that other faiths uh, uh, experience in their day to day basis i think this could be a, this is a positive aspect but i see that there is a kind of a negative part Absolutely. to it as well because people take life for granted i mean geeta says you have to do your swadharma you know swadharnam swadharma nidhanam shreya even if you have to die for it we have to do the swadharma but we don't care about dharma i mean that is kind of the modern uh, 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 you know uh, the modern development so to speak is that we are happy with you know pursuit of artha and kama and we are uh, we are like sab chalta hai don't care don't give attitude so what are your comments on that absolutely so anything any philosophy anything if it's taken to its ati sarvatra varjayet if we take it to its extreme then the element of tamas increases hugely alasya which is what we have witnessed many of us falling into the trap of acha chalo chalta hai there are lifetimes that's the extreme so you forget that for that you require vivek for vivek which is the dis discriminatory mind you require your sadhana you require certain rituals in your life you require certain discipline you require certain values in fact what you are talking about right now swadharme nidhanam shreya par dharme bhayavah is exactly what so i come from a tradition of the indian army and my father was in the gurkhas so this is exactly the motto we have for our uh, nine gurkha rifles which is swadharme nidhanam shreya so you have to be working for your own dharma it's not that you don't have to be working and yet while working it's the same thing na if you keep the falakanksha that is where you need to have a relaxed attitude in terms of the falakanksha but not in terms of the effort putting effort has to be 100% no compromise on that but as far as falakanksha is concerned you better have a relaxed attitude about when you are going to there's a i mean since i'm a storyteller you will permit me to tell you a very short story on this there is a story That's about good. yeah <laughs> there is a story <laughs> there's a story about you know how there were these um perhaps it's around narad if i'm not uh, mistaken because he's the naughty uh, rishi so there's a story about you know how there was one ascetic who was sitting and he was doing his puja and saying it's been so many lifetimes and i still haven't got moksha and what is this and what is that this is not fair i've been practicing so hard and it's not happening and narada is passing through and he says i'm going to the lord you know vaikuntha you want me to uh, communicate a message he says ask him when am i coming i deserve it enough what is this so he says all right i'll ask him and then he goes further and under a tree is a beautiful uh, let's say because i love the banyan there is a beautiful banyan tree under which there is a bhakt who's dancing who is singing you know could be like a baul he could be like a mystic dancer he is on his own trip huh? singing the songs of the lord and going absolutely wild with ecstasy so narad says do you want me to communicate something to him so he says yeah you can ask him you know when am i going to get his darshan you know so narad goes when he comes back so he tells the uh, the the ascetic that sorry but the lord has said that you will have to practice for five janmas more <laughs> he says what nonsense five janmas are you crazy i've already been practicing for so many janmas nonsense this that the other rubbish this goes huh? so he tells the bhakta he says i'm very very sorry your case is even worse because the lord says that you will have to be practicing till as many leaves that are on this tree you know what the bhakta says the bhakta says 
Only this tree? <laughs> you mean not the forest? Just this tree? Oh, yes, this is brilliant. And then he keeps on dancing and dancing. And the story goes that in that ecstasy <laughs> is the liberation. <laughs> so, yes, uh, while that's the other side of it. The, the practice is important, but the phalakamsha, the desire for attaining, the desire for becoming uh, is where the problem comes. For that, one has to have an extremely relaxed attitude, a thousand years or a yuga yuga plan in our case. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is a very, you know, uh, interesting way of putting it. Yuga plan, you know, thousand yeah, yeah. years. <laughs> Absolutely. This is just the, not even the middle of the Kali Yuga, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> no, no, we are actually not entered the proper Kali Yuga at all, even now. <laughs> so, so the fun is just beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Tighten your seat belts and get ready for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, moving on. So, uh, how did you get it to in this meditation? I mean, how, how did this happen? Uh, what part of your life meditation uh, you started meditating or uh, how did you start and uh, who, who are the figures whom you perhaps consider as your guru or teacher or teacher like i mean we all have had influences in our life sometimes directly sometimes indirectly so yes. tell us more about this i mean it's, it, this is again a two part question one is about uh, the meditation uh, and the other is about the influence so, um, how did meditation happen in my life? Um, so, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange thing which I'm going to say on a platform, uh, uh, which is Advaita Academy, but well, <laughs> this is what is Advaita about life. Meditation happened to me when I was in college. Two instances when um, two series of instances, one, uh, certainly one, ins one instance when it happened. It, in Delhi, in the late 90s, we had a huge culture of discotheques, okay? Where uh, many of us who love dancing, we'd go out and dance at night, any music. And it was a very, uh, it was a very happening and a very happy scene of uh, dis disco going in Delhi at that time. Not really just lounging and pubbing and drinking, but dancing for the sake of dancing. That's what we used to go for. And many of us from college would go to uh, discs to dance. And my first experience of meditation happened in a discotheque where I started dancing and the person in front of me absolutely disappeared. In fact, the whole floor entirely vanished. I shut my eyes and I would go into an ecstatic dance. Whatever the music would be, you could play trance, you could play uh, any pop music, any Bollywood music, and I would be in another space. It wasn't that you required uh, not a single drop of alcohol, mind you, but the joy of dancing and the, the delight, the ecstasy. I'd be jumping off the floor. I'd be whirling. I'd be literally people would have to say, oh, stay away from uh, Akanksha. That's, that's a dangerous one to be around, to dance around. Because, I mean, genuinely, the person in front stopped mattering and the crowds disappeared and you'd only become the dance. And... Um, uh, that was my uh, first experience of uh, an insight. Uh, let me put it this way, meditation as an introversion of senses, where the exteriority of my own body, my own social presence, the presence of my partner, sadly, <laughs> even that stopped mattering and my senses introverted. And inside, there was a play of energy which was taking place, which is actually the most, I would say, the pure form of dance, where dance stops being merely a performance, but dance becomes a celebration from within. It's not 
to impress someone on the outside, unlike what dance is seen as. But dance is something which emerges as a spontaneous flowering from within of your own joy, your own ecstasy, your own ananda. So that's my first experience of meditation, which happened in a series. And second, which is another, um, perhaps uh, many people would not speak about it uh, in this sense, but is an experience in a crematorium. One of my uh, most beloved teachers uh, passed away at a very young age, and I was still his student. It was a very, very deeply shocking experience for me. And of course, there was an immense amount of sadness, immense amount of tears. But I remember when I moved out after his body was cremated, the sense of, uh, I think the only way to put it, uh, it the, the word is just anand, which does not mean a, uh, unlike what is usually seen, it does not have a, it is not, um, it's not hot with joy. It is a very cool, calm, quiet, silent presence. Indescribable in words, actually. And perhaps this is the first time on a, on a, on a public medium that I'm speaking about it. it I, just, I just knew I had tasted something which was more than what all the material joys, what all the material achievements in this world could offer to me. What that was, I did not have a word for. I was too young. I did not have a word for that. But I knew it was something which I had to, since you're calling it a quest, <laughs> that there was, there was ignited an inner quest to, to taste that experience again and again. And um, by the grace of the divine, I have been fortunate to get glimpses of that in various points in my life. Uh, sometimes points have been extremely challenging in terrible pain. But even then, you can, you can sense that polarity. That's where the Advait comes in. Within immense pain, immense, almost fire, total cool, total calm both together. I've, I've been graceful for, uh, graced by that, thankfully. As far as, um, so that's how meditation really started uh, in my life. And who have been the guru-like figures in my life to, um, again, let me just give a spin to this because to, I wouldn't want to start with the spiritual paths because often life, uh, is seen, like you pointed out in your conversation, right, in what you said, that often it's seen as, you know, that meditation is separate from life. Navel gazers. Meditation and spirituality means you just sit in one little place and you're constantly gazing. No. My gurus have been people who've been engaged with life. My, to begin with, my biggest guru, of course, has been my mother, who has passed on the tradition of my family's women, her grandmother, her great grandmother, my own nanny to me. That's been the first, you know, there is a story of, uh, we are Kumaunis, all right, which are from Uttarakhand, a region in Uttarakhand, you'd be more familiar with Nenital, Armora, that region, the Himalayan uh, so we are the Himalayan women <laughs> who have settled in Delhi for a long time now. My grandmother's family migrated here in the late 1800s. And the story goes that my nani's grandmother, when it was full moon night, she and her family, I'm talking about the late 1800s. So just picturize that and Delhi at that time, late 1800s during full moon, she and her friends would quietly sneak out from the homes and go to Yamuna Tat, the banks of Yamuna, and do a ras under the full moon. 
So these are the stories which I have inherited as a part of my family lineage. So we've always been uh, a family of, uh, how to put it, maybe ecstatic women. <laughs> so yes, a mother has been passing those on to me, all my shlok, which she has taught me since I was a baby, I thank her. Uh, shlok in the form of dances that she has taught to me in the form of Bharatnatyam, which have actually been one of the best ways for me to learn, not just as words, but to do, you know, whether it's someone sleeping. So you're saying, you know, this is Vishnu, which is sleeping. So there's a gesture to it. As a child, you would remember that very beautifully. Uh, then it's Hanuman Chalisa, which she has taught me. She's taught me Kabir ke dohe, Meera ke geet. So, you know, there's a wide repertoire, which you have been lucky enough to get a mother to, who has gifted those things to you. As your first guru, who else is, who else can you say? And then my father, because of um, the fact he was a brigadier in the Indian army and father would often go to the field areas. And you knew that once you're going to the field areas um, and to the, uh, you know, war zones, there is a chance that you may not come back. And as, as a child, watching your father go, your mother being, you know, tender because the father is going and you don't know whether they're going to come back safe. There is constant awareness again of death. And that constant awareness of death, I believe, gives a sharpness to the intensity of the life which you live, which again is something which I think is special about India. Because in India, the Lord of Death also is a guru. Nachiket. So, the, I mean, we have the courage to accept the Lord of Death as a guru. And who else but, you know, young can teach you. So that awareness, and especially in such a time when we are passing through COVID. <laughs> so that awareness of death, which thanks to my father's profession, uh, came. Uh, that has been the second learning. Then all the people who have uh, been a part of my films, uh, the complexities which their lives have presented, what I have witnessed, all of that has been a great grounds for me to learn uh, from life, from people who are living. They are the ones who have enriched my meditation. People who have been as engaged with karma as anything else. If you've seen Earth Witness, for example, there's a farmer in Sundarban who is a Bengali farmer. The amount he has taught me, oh gosh, just listening to him, you see the entire teachings of Advait given by a simple farmer sitting in a do bigha zameen in a small, obscure, you wouldn't have even heard of the village's name in Sundarbans. And you get that from that person. That's the beauty of India. You will find gurus everywhere in this land. This land itself is the biggest guru, I would say. You know? And then, of course, there have been spiritual masters who've been, um, I mean, who I bow to. The foremost being the most controversial and the most rebellious son of India, I would say. Uh, I would also add the most courageous son of India, which is Osho. Then there is uh, Swami Lakshmanju from the Pratibhigya Darshan tradition, which I feel very deeply in tune with, the Trika. Uh, then there is Ma Anandmai, whose grace is beyond description, uh, you know. Uh, and of course, uh, from my teachings, whatever little I have learned, I'm the only person out of uh, this lot who I have managed to meet in person is Swami Dayanand Saraswati from Arshavidya. Uh, his teachings of Advaita have been amazing because he has both the sharpness, the clarity, as well as the humor, which, which can take us all and which can, you know, sort of string it all together for us. He's been, again, a very, very uh, strong guidance in my life. Yes. That, that's a very uh, wonderful and fascinating account, I should say. So many different influences. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so uh, I can relate to some of it uh, since, in a sense, that 
my own reading influences uh, on spirituality has been equally diverse uh, mm. uh, at one time i was i had i had extensively read osho oh. uh, at one time <laughs> and i have read many others so swami rama osho oh. ramana maharshi oh. and uh, i come from a uh, ritualistically kind of a shakta perspective as well oh. so <laughs> so yeah it's it's interesting i think lot of us uh, especially those uh, who are in a, born in a urban setting uh, have these diverse uh, yes. influences and that shape our life and world view so uh, moving further i want to ask a few questions uh, regarding you as a filmmaker you have been doing film making for a long time now and you have created so many documentaries so you made an important comment a while back that people tend to see uh, spirituality and meditation as a separate compartment and uh, the other secular life as a separate compartment but it is not so and this is a this is a vision which is prevalent throughout the tradition uh, across i mean i have heard so many teachers making this very point that there is no difference of sacred and profane in hindu dharma all life is sacred so uh, so how do from this perspective how do you see your work of film making as a film maker how do you practice this so to speak in your daily life how does this vision uh, affect your work or influence your work on a day to day basis beautifully put uh, nitin uh, beautifully put because truly that is what it is um when you are a seeker hmm, uh then whatever you do is an exploration of that dimension of the divine um there is a very beautiful um uh, uh, you know a uh, shlok from the uh, shri swachhand tantra which is yatra yatra mano yati geyam tatreva chintayet chalitva yasyate kutra sarvam shivamayam yatah where where the mind goes there there think deep where can the mind go what can it do for everything is shiva itself hmm? so to me all of the work is literally a manifestation and an exploration of the divine leela the divine play and uh, my journey began quite clearly with the understanding uh, so i have uh, I graduated in journalism from Lady Sri Ram then I have gone on to do my masters in mass communication from uh, Jamia Millia Islamia and um, you know that is the the early 2000s when um, literally the media industry was opening up and uh, the news channels were just coming in and all of us were being lapped up from these these are the cream institutions in india right so we were all being lapped up to become a part of the news industry i don't know i mean why but i was very fortunate to get this very clear thinking from a young age that i should only speak about what is my experience and about what i know because it's very easy to start repeating things when you watch other people do it or when you read texts and as far as journalism was concerned or even talking about films was concerned at that time or talking about india was concerned which is what many of us who had a half decent face who were doing as anchors you know in journalism in mainstream journalism at that time was i really don't know anything about india right now i have no idea yes i have traveled much around india yes i have studied a few books in political science a few books in economics sure i know how to handle the camera sure i know how to record the sound sure i have a half decent face i can talk a little you know i know a little bit of english or hindi and i can pass off as an anchor but hang on i know nothing 
first i need to start exploring i need to be in a position to understand something myself before i can communicate it which is where actually filmmaking starts from that i wanted to be a student of india i wanted to explore india in multiple dimensions and how to explore india to listen to her people because the i realized since i was in college that the the beauty which i found in conversations with people the real people the panwalas the cycle wala the rickshaw walas the the chai walas you know the the bus wale bhaiyas the conductors the train drivers the conversations which i had with those people and the teachings which they taught me no text in economics political science nothing could teach me india for me was something that her people could teach me and that is where my journey of film making started from i wanted to become a student sit at their feet which is literally what i have done i have sat at the feet of each of my protagonists and because i am also a woman i also have a feminine nature i have an i have a nature of absorbing so to imbibe from them what their lives experiences have been that's that's been the that's been the learning so what happens to you you're also very selfish right as in as a seeker <laughs> <laughs> because what ends up happening is i can only live this one life right now right and i can only have this much of experience but if i chat with you nitin right now you are speaking with me hopefully i'll get a chance to interview some you sometime <laughs> <laughs> so you know when i listen to you talk your experience becomes a part of my life so my life and my life's experience kitty the little kitty little basket of my experiences of life becomes richer so i have within one life also got so much more life also got so much more richer experience so that is what helps you as a meditator as a seeker as a bhakt because you see what tulsi das beautifully puts hari anant hari katha ananta so hari is infinite and the stories of hari are infinite so i am an explorer of those infinity of stories through the medium of documentary show sure. <laughs> that's wonderful <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, your earlier documentaries uh, your last documentary was hindu nectar the spiritual wanderings in india but the earlier ones were mostly on ecology mm -hmm. so what made you take up this uh, particular idea of uh, hindu nectar and uh, Uh, what were some of the challenges you faced uh, i have watched this hindu nectar and it is extremely well made uh, and i know it has been very well acclaimed especially i think uh, uh, the the uh, the vibes i got from watching it was that it was more focused on a uh, out of india outside of india audience uh, perhaps an nri audience or a expats audience but also i thought in a sense it would be very appealing to even urban audience considering how the current uh, hindu urban youth are completely deracinated and de alienated from you know uh, de linked from their civilization alienated from the civilization so this this is a very good introduction uh, to the spiritual variety i remember that uh, you know uh, my own journey happened some somewhat like started with an atheism Uh, and uh, influenced by the socrates and other greek philosophers i was a atheist in high school but later kind of come back home you know discovering the uh, hindu philosophy and spirituality and one of the books which uh, extremely influenced me was swami rama's living with the himalayan masters oh yes the, the the one thing that it did was to show me that there are living people our tradition is not dead it is not a museum piece there are still people today with powers there are still people today with spiritual attainments with attainments of knowledge so this is a living tradition 
and i, I when I, i saw your documentary and i this is the comparison uh, that that this is the idea that i got this is the pulse uh, i got that your documentary shows to especially people outside india especially the people in the urban india uh, that even today the dharma is alive and kicking you know it's not dead it's not despite you know what our detractors want us to be dead we are not dead we are very much here and we are very much flourishing even though it may not appear so in our urban setting which is too much uh, you know saturated with uh, copying you know imitation of the west so so what are the challenges i mean i my question got very long <laughs> oh, nice. basically what are the challenges you face while making the hindu nectar and uh, what made you take up this topic and importantly i see that uh, the the saints the people you chose to focus uh, on in the documentary were for should i say unusual you know mm-hmm. uh, india has so many gurus so many teachers of so many sampradayas but you have chosen some out of the ordinary especially uh, some non indian uh, uh, teachers who are living in india and who are trying to go back to that source so what was the criteria that uh, that made you choose these people so um let's begin with uh, the the first part on uh, after the ecological films how come uh, hindu nectar so you are a seeker yourself and you will understand what i'm saying one begins to destroy the forests outside only when one has destroyed the forest inside one begins to trap and dam the rivers outside when one has dammed the inner river of bliss one forgets the art of appreciating the life of a desert only when one has forgotten how to take water from those hidden sources which are present in every desert on this earth destruction of the nature outside begins after the destruction of the nature and the harmony of the inner nature has already happened this came to me as a very very deep realization after having made my films on ecological disasters over almost a decade um i also realized in uh i had gone to for example there was this world social forum which had taken place in 2004 in mumbai where another world is possible was the theme of the world social forum and there were activists and students who had gathered from everywhere saying another world is possible which was a very beautiful um idea very beautiful concept of course why is it not another world is possible there was one incident which shook me very very deeply um uh, somebody uh, you know a, a coca cola truck had come in to um uh, uh, you know uh, supply some co- cokes to the uh, canteen which had been set up in the world social forum and the activists got after the truck driver banging the truck shouting at the truck driver almost ready to get him off the truck at that point i was filming um now because i do my own filming and i'm also a camera woman i get a chance to witness at multiple levels <laughs> so i was 
taking a close up of the face of the uh, the the truck driver at that time and i saw in his eyes a fear a trembling within just as i saw in the eyes of the people who were banging the doors of the coca cola van a kind of a devil like aggression at that time within this nitin i i it was very clear for me that we were getting something extremely wrong that man was doing his job he his he was a poor man who had to somehow deliver those bottles to the venue that was all his job was he was not the evil itself we were attacking somebody we were taking out our aggression the violence that was within us this 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 almost desire i could see anger no that's not what ecology is about that is not what nature is about nature is also about empathy it's about harmony it's about understanding the situation it's about vivek you want to attack coca cola you think coca cola is doing something wrong there is a way to do that that poor driver what did he do at that time from that point it just i i had this feeling that there was something which we were getting right and constantly throughout no matter what films i made no matter what i did whether it was about climate change everything i just realized i was doing a token service i was talking about environment sure everybody was feeling good for a while i was getting awards sure after my most awarded film on environment i didn't make a single film on environment i could have i mean i would have got a lot of funding for it i didn't because i realized kisi pe kuch asar hi nahi padega <laughs> and kuch asar nahi padega because uh, i mean people don't even understand what environment i mean it's just become a it's just become a word for activism i'm not saying that's there for everyone but it's become a thing it's a point to be proven whereas nature inner ecology till you have an understanding of the inner ecology till you your inner ecology is in harmony till you can understand what the inner dimensions of play are within yourself to speak about the outer ecology is just doing lip service or making sure your own job is fine <laughs> that's it so it had to be an exploration of meditation it had to be an exploration of inner ecology it had to be processes that go deeper and the hindu philosophy is i would say uh, something that gives us all the tools for sustainable life and living so the quest and the search for it had to begin from uh a uh, 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 an understanding of the hindu philosophies i mean our sages are the ones who have called uh, surya dev a god the river a mother you know the earth a mother uh, so you have to start understanding how the sacred unless the sacred is understood just to talk about environment as a secular thing doesn't work it doesn't have the bhav for many people it doesn't get the bhav and unless the bhav is there it doesn't work so hindu nectar now the other part of your thing about um, the 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 choice of people uh, who were there you know you said you uh, the challenges which we faced so the challenge sabse bada to challenge tha that how do you put something which is like the ganga herself you know coming down i am not a shiva <laughs> it's the ganga the sanatan ganga which is coming down how can you put it together in a small short 48 45 minute long film how is it possible um after i mean it took me a long time to figure out and to say that i can only do it as a daughter 
who is attempting and I'm still attempting to learn something about this, this, uh, whew, this oceanic wisdom source, which has been a gift for people like us. So it has to be done with extreme humility and with a lot of prayers that, oh Lord, please allow this to happen because mere bas ka to nahi hai, tum karwa lo to bhaiya, tum hi jano. <laughs> That was the biggest challenge. And um, the choice of characters which was uh, made, the protagonists who were made, as a filmmaker uh, and a seeker, I tend, to, um, I tend to go with an open slate. I don't go with a plan as such. Uh, also because I call my way of filmmaking a very feminine filmmaking. I am... I literally go very open. Uh, I, I'm going there to learn. I'm not going there to give. So I go there and I seek out the teachers who will teach me and who will give me sutras that will deepen my own experience of whatever I'm choosing to tell the story of at that time. And these were the teachers who uh, I instinctively wiped with. So it was a very instinctive tuning which happened, whether it's with Christopher, whether it's with the uh, Spanish sannyasi, whether it's with the, you know, the, the, uh, Christopher is the Australian minor, uh, whether it's with uh, KV Subramaniam, KVS, uh, who, is, who is, was such a, I mean, I have reams and reams of conversations. So all my films usually have around about 200 or 300 hours of footage out of which I have to cull about 45 minutes, you know. <laughs> wow, 200 hours. <laughs> Minimum. I talk, uh, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of conversations, which is why I'm saying sometime probably I'll get a chance to interview you, Nitin. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, yes, so it's, it's listening to a lot, absorbing it, seeing how it wipes, and there, there was another aspect to it because it was being made for the Ministry of External Affairs, specifically with the aim that this film is for the uninitiated, quote unquote. And it was meant as a film to be kept in the Indian embassies. That was the target, that we'll keep it in the Indian embassies all over the world so that if anybody comes and anybody wants to know what is your tradition, what is your philosophy, you can give it to them, say, take a look, maybe you'll get an insight into that, right? That was the aim uh, of the film. Because it was made for the uninitiated, the language in which we would speak had to be something which would be accessible to the people who had not heard many of the concepts that we have sort of just grown with, you know? And the best people to teach are already people who have come, who have been born in a different culture, but now today are so deeply ingrained in this philosophical tradition that some of us come as students to learn from them. So that is why people like Christopher, uh, you know, really matter. I mean, all of these people, they've learned a lot and they've, um, uh, that is also the mother embrace of India that she can literally reach out and grace and both embrace uh, seekers from all over the world, which has been happening since decades now, you know, centuries actually. Now, um, and um, is there something else I wanted to add to that? Yes, the aspect which you said about um, how, you know, I was actually surprised. I really thought this was meant for an international, primarily an international audience, which did not know. But I was surprised after the film was released, how much it, it made sense to my friends who were born in urban uh, surroundings in India. I was surprised uh, because it spoke to them. And that's when I realized that, oh gosh, we've gone really far away. Which is why the first line of the, uh, the film is Baba Tisra Din. This is my third day in India. So that was done specifically, uh, as in very, very consciously. Because even though I live in India, I've been in India, and 
by the grace of God, someday I will leave this body <laughs> in this land only. Uh, there are many things which make us very far away from India because of the kind of world that we live in, because of the play, the Leela of the Sansar at present. We are here and yet it's possible for us to be living in our imagination completely far away. And that hid, that, that India which exists at the mystic level gets deeply hidden, deeply silent, deeply quiet. She becomes like the Saraswati. Present, but not present, cannot be seen. So to discover that Saraswati, each one of us needs to take that dive again. Wonderful. That is true. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all are mostly, you know, in our day-to-day -day life living on a surface. You know, we don't experience the real India, so to speak. Mm -hmm. The spiritual India, the sacred India. I think uh, this may not have been a reality even 200 years back. Uh, uh, you know, we were very much connected to our land. We had our deities. We are connected to our Kula Devatas, our Grama Devatas and all. But the effect of uh, urbanization, colonization, and the westernization. So we are slowly losing the plot. <laughs> but you know, Nitin, I take a more uh, optimistic view of it. Uh, since we are a part of the Sanatan Dharma and we believe everything is the divine, this is the present Leela of the divine. And how we can, how we can play this Leela and yet create our own uh, different rivers within this Leela is the challenge for us as people who are believers in Sanatan Dharma, because this is his game. Colonization was his game. Uh, the, the, the westernization which has happened today, the, I would say the globalization, the modernization which is happening today is his game. So is the reaction in people such as yourself and myself. The responses which are emerging, this language which is emerging is his play also. And how this happens and how we become a vehicle for him is the whole, uh, if we can just take a little, little, uh, you know, step back a little and see it as his Leela, it will just relax us enough to be able to take on this sansara with more grace and more beauty and playfulness, which is the need for our times. And honestly, India is the only civilization of this scale left with such a language all over the world, which has not been flattened by globalization, by the global factory, not the village, the global factory till hmm. now. We are the only ones who have this language left, who have the language of playfulness of, you know, we have a Sanat Kumar, we have shark the tradition, the Devi Paramparas, the feminine tradition in India. Come on. I mean, we're the only ones which are surviving and thriving at this scale. This is special. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. That is uh, very beautifully put. We are special and this is, of course, Leela. Even uh, the destruction is the Bhagavan's Leela. So uh, every destruction leads to new creation. So ultimately, of course, uh, but we all have to play our role and that, 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 that is the vision we should not miss. So moving further, uh, we are since almost uh, coming towards the end of the, uh, this uh, interview session. I want to ask you about the meditation retreats that you mm -hmm. conduct. You have been conducting for quite a while now. And um, uh, so to tell us more about this uh, meditation retreat, which uh, is, I think I saw in your website, you call it as a creative meditation retreat. So uh, what is the, I'm, I'm very intrigued, you know, what is the creative aspect of it? So uh, please share more details about what you do. So since in the last thing we were talking about Leela, uh, so let me put it this way, uh, all the meditation retreats which I do have thematically, it's, uh, let's, let's give it a new name uh, of uh, uh, the darshan that I follow is that of uh, being Leela Mai, <laughs> which is to be, uh, to be involving all the plays, all the arts of the divine that I can possibly engage with in the present urban modern context, you know, which is theater, which is dance, which is, well, yes, 
part of theater, acting also, which is group activities, which is group plays which happen, you know, little games that you play around with. All of that to support the telling of the sacred, to support an atmosphere of the sacred. And I'll go back to a very beautiful sutra of uh, Guru Goraknath, in which he says, um, Hasiba Khaliba Dhariba Dhyan, Ahirnis Tathiba Brahma Gyan. Hasiba, laugh, Khaliba, play, Hasiba Khaliba Dhariba. To dharana, have the dharana of dhyan. Hasiba Khaliba Dhariba Dhyan, Ahirnis Tathiba. Forever keep saying the truth of the Brahman, Brahma Gyan, the ultimate, the divine, the absolute. So the methodology I follow is actually based on this grounding given by Guru Goraknath, which is Hasiba Khaliba Dhariba Dhyan. So in this, the, this also I, I, I come from the tradition of uh, my, my family's women who have always had fun around religion. It's never been, a, a, you know, with long faces hanging and, oh, we are talking about religion now. <laughs> it's always been joyous. It's always been fun. It's always been deeply participatory. It's not been one way. It's been, it's been an engagement. For me as a child, since that time, I have learned of religion in such a way. And again, I do not distinguish between I'm only spiritual and not religious. I think those things are, uh, those things are really faffy. Okay, they don't work. I am both religious and spiritual because religion is the body and spi uh, spirituality is the spirit of the body. So it's both together. It goes as one. So, and anything becomes a religion. India has a hajar sampradayas, lakho sampradayas. So religion is anything, you know, which has a body. It becomes religion. That's my understanding of it. So anyway, so the meditation retreats, what I often end up doing is exploring either a particular, uh, a particular sampraday, a particular saint, for example, it could be Dadu Dayal, Sant Dadu Dayal, who's from Ahmedabad. Right now, the meditation retreat, which I did, is, mm -hmm. um, is based on one of his very beautiful uh, dohas. He says, uh, uh, so the story goes that Akbar had invited Sant Dadu Dayal once and said that, uh, what is the jati of Allah? You tell me. Jati, which means the caste of Allah of the Ishwar, you tell me. So he says very beautifully, he responds to it. He says, Ishq Allah ki jat hai, Ishq Allah ka ang, Ishq Allah maujood hai, Ishq Allah ke rang. Meaning, love is the clan, the caste, the sect of the Lord itself. Love is his body. Love is his presence. If you want to feel the presence of the Lord, feel love. And finally, uh, love is his colors, all his colors. That is what is love. So when you explore, and this is, I think, 16th century, Sant Dadu Dayal. So you take one particular thing and you explore it from multiple directions the dimensions. We were also exploring, um, you would have heard of uh, an amazing Indo-Tibetan guru called Atish Deepankar Shri Gyan, who was a prince in uh, uh, what is now Bangladesh, at that time Bengal in the 10th century, who went from India to um, uh, Indonesia, Java, Sumatra, to study under a guru, Dharmakirti, in the 10th century, principles of uh, Mahayan and Vajrayan Buddhism. And then he came back in the 10th century, 13 months he traveled to go to uh, Indonesia to learn under Dharmakirti, came back to India, taught in Vikramshila University, and then he was, the Tibetans came to invite him 
and take him to revive the dharma in tibet and he went to tibet and literally carved out beautiful understandings what he calls what his disciples later codified in the 17th and the 18th century as seven point mind training which actually you can connect back with um, with one shlok which is sarve bhavantu sukhina sarve santu niramaya sarve badrani pashyantu ma kashchid bhag 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 bhavet how does this shlok translate into a practice this is a shlok this is a place where a rishi has arrived sarve bhavantu sukhina vasudheva kutumbakam this is a final statement of a rishi saying aham brahmam okay this is the ultimate but as a practitioner what are the steps that i can follow to reach the sarve bhavantu sukhina damn it right now i am only so dukhi that how am i going to make sarve bhavantu sukhina i may word it say sarve bhavantu sukhina tang 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 but there's no way i can actually say it right how do i get to be in an inner space that can give you that can give myself that can give this world the blessings so the steps which are required and those steps are like a b c d steps that are required so the meditation practices we were doing like a nine week every saturday we were doing a, a night guided meditation on that you know uh, atisha's heart sutras in which you unlike you are give you know usually it's said that give out the negativity don't keep anything negative inside give out the negative and take in the positive this is entirely the reverse this says you take in all the negativity of the world and see the potential which your heart has to transform that negativity and spread out love so this is the alchemy of the heart which works alchemy of love that works alchemy of that one word sarve bhavantu sukhina that which works so that you are in a position to actually wish that on other people so these are processes which i go through so whether it's atish whether it's uh, dadu dayal whether it's neera whether it's nanak whether it's narad's bhakti sutra whether it's shiv sutra whether it's vigyan bhairav so there are a dimension of retreats kabir which i have done over the years which actually help me also to co participate with other people and go because i don't claim to be a guru and i do not think anyone can gift meditation to anyone else all you can do as a facilitator is create an atmosphere create an energy space of meditative possibilities and then what is to happen will always happen with the grace of the lord we are no one to do that so that's how i design it that that's a very beautifully put uh, that uh, i am not a teacher but a mere facilitator i mean that that's a beautiful insight i mean uh, that the, that lot of people don't uh, appreciate today and i see that uh, i'm glad to hear that uh, uh, perspective uh, uh, with this uh, akanksha ji we come to a uh, conclusion of very fascinating uh, discussion i should i would say and perhaps we could continue this discussion uh, some other time in a more depth i was uh, very happy to hear uh, so diverse of experiences uh, the diverse traditions that you have derived from goraknath to uh, shiva samhita to advaita vedanta it's, it's wonderful and uh, we have a lot more to discuss but unfortunately we have to uh, conclude here and on the behalf of entire advaita academy and all our viewers uh, we i thank you for again for doing this interview with us uh, for sharing your insights with all of us thank you very much thank you very much for the invitation thank you very much for the uh, for the uh, for the receptive hearing because i do realize since i have been on the other side also that an interviewer is only as good as the interviewee 
No, it's the other way around. <laughs> the, the interviewee is only as good as the interviewer. <laughs> Actually, it's both ways. <laughs> yes. So, thank you very much for allowing this uh, communion to happen and this conversation to happen. I really appreciate that. Hopefully, we'll be in the other position pretty soon. <laughs> Hopefully, look forward to it. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thanks. Namaste. Thank you. Viewers, uh, don't uh, forget to subscribe our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and to know about our regular programs that we conduct. So with this, uh, we come conclude this session. Shri Guru Pyoram.